Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today and to have this opportunity to share some of my experiences from uh, my, my work uh, so far in fisheries uh, development. And in this series of four lectures, what, what I've tried to do is bring to you some of the most important principles that I think I, I have learnt. Uh, I have observations about uh, how fisheries development is approached, both from a point of view of the uh, policy framework of the country concerned, but also from the donor point of view. Uh, I think uh, there have been many mistakes that have been made in this area, and many mistakes continue to be made. And uh, my hope is that I can give you a flavor of some of the issues and uh, ideas that uh, I've been able to distill from my experiences that can help you to maybe avoid some of these pitfalls uh, in, in the future. So my first presentation is on, on the subject of why are we here, really? What, what are the reasons for uh, fishing? And, of course, uh, I think we often forget uh, when we're setting out in our daily work what it is all about. We, we're focusing on issues of sustainability, we're f focusing on issues of improving production or getting aquaculture going or improving control systems um, or developing new products and so on. But we often forget that the basic reason, there are only really three fundamental reasons. And I think these need to be always at the forefront of our, our thinking. It's either for, for the economic benefits which fisheries can bring in terms of money, or employment uh, in terms of jobs for people, or food security. And I think when we're setting out on a development path, we have to bear in mind uh, these, these various issues, and particularly from the point of view of getting to know our, our data. Uh, because one of the things that's really occurred to me is that uh, very often uh, policies are made, projects are designed, but we don't actually have a solid data about, piece of data about these three areas of economics, employment and, and food security, uh, contributions from the fishery sector. And in fact, this was, uh, this came home to me once when uh, I was speaking to an old fisherman who was a Shetlander, so not so far from here, and saying things as he saw them. And he, he said, and this was a lifetime's wisdom uh, that he, he brought, saying, the trouble with fisheries is there's too much knowledge, everybody's got solutions, everybody knows what should be done, but nobody has got any data. And this is something uh, that I feel quite passionately about. And in this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about how we can uh, generate relevant data sets in these areas to be able to uh, make sensible policies. Uh, so when we look at these benefits in a bit more detail, what are the reasons for going fishing? Well, of course, we have uh, the economics, which is to do with uh, value added. Now, when I go around talking about value added, I find that very often people think about value added as something that happens once you bring the fish to the shore, so that you can do something to it to add value to it. Well, that's, that's a kind of consumer uh, uh, definition, where we think about maybe high-level processing, freezing, portioning, coating with breadcrumbs, these kind of things. But there is an economic definition which we have to think about, and this is the one which uh, I think is more important, which is the amount by which the value of an article is increased at each stage of its production, exclusive of initial costs. So we can actually use this approach uh, to, to understand better some of the uh, benefits of, of fishing. And ultimately, in terms of value added, we also have to think about what alternative approaches can, can be, or what alternative activities could replace fishing. 
uh, because fisheries is just an economic activity, no different from any other activity. And ultimately, if the resources which we tie up in the fishery sector are going to be better employed in some other activity, then they should be allowed to be diverted to that, to that sector. And that's why when we think about fisheries from an economic point of view, we always need to consider what alternative activities may be available to the people who are engaged in, in fishing. So where do we add value in capture fisheries? Well, uh, once we have the product produced, the process of extracting fish from the sea or the, the, the lake generates additional value added uh, in various activities. So there is a value, value added in fishing itself, there is a value added in processing and distribution. Each of those stages adds economic value to, to the product. Um, and fishing as an activity generates both uh, upstream and downstream value added. So we can have uh, processes which provide inputs to the fisheries, uh, such as uh, fuel and food for the crew and shipbuilding, all of which gain value from that fishing activity. Uh, these are indirect uh, uh, value-added inputs. Downstream, we can have things like production and supply of packaging, ingredients, equipment, uh, fuels, vehicle, ice. All of these supplies into downstream activities also bring economic benefits. Um, and the point with all of these is that throughout the chain, we can actually look at where they're where they're added, and this is for a, a capture fishery. Each step will add value uh, from fishermen, traders, processors, importers, retailers. Uh, all will have uh, value-added activities. And uh, similarly, if we have aquaculture systems, again, direct value-added throughout the chain, hatcheries, grow out, processing, distribution. All of these activities will uh, contribute uh, value added. And the point here is that we can calculate the amount of value added at each stage. Uh, so again, in the distribution chain, this is slightly more complex. We have uh, all the input suppliers for feed, going up to the feed mill. Uh, we have uh, hatchery supply systems, we have other inputs such as veterinary medicines, all of these will generate value added linked to the production of, uh, of the fishery product. So the principle here is that at each stage we can actually calculate the value added at each of, in each of these uh, levels of the distribution. And there are various techniques that uh, economists can use for, for this. Uh, estimation of value added is simply a sum of uh, profits, labor, and taxes. Uh, so profits we can calculate simply by looking at an enterprise and uh, deducting the costs from the revenues. Uh, labor is calculated by wages and social security payments, uh, taxes as uh, various taxes and charges by government for license fees and so on. And we can calculate these through gathering data from fisheries enterprises. We can actually go out and interview them and look at their financial affairs and we can calculate the uh, the, 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 the amount of value added based on either an individual fisheries operator or we can add groups of operators together and calculate for a group. We can work on the basis of a region, so look at the fisheries activity in a region and, uh, and, and uh, aggregate value added there or by different activities, by processing, or aquaculture, or 
input supplies. And we could even, by adding all of these things together across a whole economy, uh, this is in fact what is the GDP, the gross domestic product. It's the sum of the value added by all economic activities within the economy. One of the things we really need to know if we're going to make any sensible decisions about how to address fisheries development is what is the contribution uh, in terms of value added of different fisheries activities. Because unless we know that, we can't really say where are the problems, where are the gaps, where are the opportunities. And uh, this is why uh, I think the first message for you is, is that uh, calculating value added is a very important uh, step to, to take in the design of any intervention activity which one is going to uh, implement for fisheries development. Um, I'd like to say a word here about export revenues. Um, very often fisheries policy is op uh, orientated towards development of exports. Uh, well, uh, the reason for this is that exports generate generally more value added for an economy. Uh, generally the prices are higher, the profits are, are, are greater. Um, otherwise, the only other advantage for uh, exports, of course, is generating some foreign currency, which allows you to perhaps trade other items uh, more, more effectively. Um, but one of the interesting points about the fishery sector particularly is that we can see here on, on the right-hand side uh, that of this graph, these are different commodities and the contribution or the level of, of international trade. And this is, this is fishery products. And you can see that fish is actually the most traded, uh, internationally traded uh, food and agricultural uh, commodity of all of these commodities such as coffee and rubber and cocoa and, and, and other products. So um, the fishery sector imports are particularly important for, for the fishery sector. And uh, we can see here on, on the, on the left-hand side, these are the latest data from uh, the FAO uh, Globefish, that the, uh, the, the anticipated level of international trade in fishery products in 2014 was 145 uh, billion uh, uh, dollars. So very significant amounts of financial trade. So ultimately that's what we can say is in volume terms approximately about a third of the fish which is produced in the world goes for international trade. So trade is vitally important uh, also as a source of uh, value added. So moving on, uh, employment in fisheries. This is the second reason why we have fishing, why we have a fishery sector, because it provides jobs for people. And uh, you can imagine a situation where a certain activity, uh, here we have a, a, a fish finger production line, uh, a packing line for small breaded fish portions. You can imagine an activity which generates a certain amount of value added, but which may not have that many jobs attached to it. Uh, and certainly some of the more advanced processing technologies employ robotics and automation, and these don't generate as much employment uh, per unit of value added as, as say, some other activities uh, where we have uh, hand filleting lines. So here uh, on, on the right hand side there's a pangasius filleting line from a, a Vietnamese factory. So whilst these two activities might generate the same level of value added in terms of profits and taxes and, 
and, and so on, the, the contribution of the labor cost to that value added can vary quite a lot. Uh, so the other thing we want to measure uh, is jobs, uh, the number of jobs that uh, we have associated with a certain uh, fisheries sector activity. Um, and another illustration of this is um, in terms of indicative employment. And this is just some data which I've pulled from various sources uh, from, from my notes over the years. But comparing three different typical methods of, of fishing, where you might have uh, an industrial freezer vessel, a modern industrial freezer vessel, uh, uh, which could be operating freezing at sea and transshipping. Uh, you would have a s uh, compare that with a semi-industrial vessel, which might have uh, might take ice, uh, but operate just on a five or six day cycle, uh, delivering into a, a port. And finally, you take an artisanal fishery, typically in a in a uh, African or a Southeast Asian. Uh, country, and and you can compare the the catch rates and the number of jobs uh, associated with uh, with each uh, unit of production. So uh, you end up with a uh, in, if you do a crude calculation of the number of jobs per uh, thousand tons of annual production, you can see that certain fishing activities uh, generate vastly more uh, employment than, than others. So uh, if you're looking from a policy point of view, you can say, well, we have so much resource, so many fishing opportunities annually in terms of a total allowable catch. Well, how are we going to divide that up between uh, industrial fisheries, uh, semi-industrial or artisanal fisheries because from a from a social impacts point of view of course you're going to get a lot more out of your resource in terms of uh, uh, incomes, uh, family incomes, sustain, sustainable jobs uh, from an artisanal fishery than you are from a, uh, 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 an industrial fishery. And this is a, an issue which is highly political, of course, uh, especially in, in many countries such as Iceland where uh, the fisheries management regime has moved across to an uh, individual transferable quota which tends to concentrate the ownership of access to the resources within a, a, a smaller number of, of operators. Um, where there may be a need then to put in certain safeguards for small-scale fishers to protect, to protect these, these, the, these jobs. The point is, I'm not saying one or the other is right, but it's a policy issue which has to be determined. It has to be set out and there has to be uh, data uh, in front of the policy makers in order to be able to make uh, these kind of, of decisions. And I think the other point I'd like to make here is that very often uh, many, many countries, the artisanal fisheries, uh, many, many developing countries, the artisanal fisheries are essentially open access fisheries. So one can enter the fishery without any kind of limitation in terms of uh, having to apply for a quota or a license which is uh, somehow capped in terms of fishing effort. And the problem with that, that kind of regime is that any efforts which you then make to improve the value added generated by the fishery, whether that is in terms of improved efficiency of fishing or better prices on the beaches because you've put in some marketing infrastructure, all of those things which might add value at some point are essentially uh, uh, dissolved or defrayed into additional entrants into the fishery. So you might get a few more uh, people coming into the fishery, 
all of that value added is consumed by generating more jobs rather than possibly making the jobs that exist into uh, more sustainable or uh, profitable uh, activities. There are links also uh, to international trade in terms of jobs as well. Uh, this is a table which came out of a, a piece of research done by uh, the FAO a, a, a few years ago. Um, there are clear links between trade and employment uh, and we can see it in some of the countries which are in this table. So if we look at countries like Cape Verde, which has a very uh, significant level of fish trade uh, as a percentage of all its agricultural exports, uh, also has high levels of, of employment in, in fisheries. Uh, it's also the case in countries such as uh, Ghana. We see uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, fish exports and high-level employment. Ghana is, is perhaps quite unique in that it has a fairly advanced processing sector with a large cannery sector which provides lots of jobs in processing. Uh, but also, it also has a, a very active fish smoking industry which uh, is also exporting regionally. And we also see in countries like Senegal, there is also fairly high employment and high level of, of fish exports. But it's not always the case that uh, countries are able to uh, get these employment benefits from their mm. fish trade. And there is a, a kind of... Um, uh, pot of gold at the foot of the rainbow, which we've all been uh, trying to find in development terms over, well, ever since I've been working in this, in this sector. Uh, and that pot of gold is to link small-scale fisheries with these enormous employment impacts to the higher value added generated by the export trade. And this is a, is a really uh, uh, key challenge, and it's very much at the core of many of the poverty reduction strategies which are expressed in the design of different fisheries projects which we, we work on in different countries. But it's very, very difficult to achieve. One of the reasons why is because of the barriers in terms of meeting international standards for hygiene and product safety and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, from the regulatory point of view, but also from the uh, voluntary standards point of view, in terms of what the buyers will accept or will not accept uh, as well. So meeting these uh, product quality and safety related requirements uh, has been the major focus of many uh, <coughs> development projects uh, and investments by both uh, donors and by, uh, uh, by governments themselves. But I have to say, without uh, uh, any really, really significant successes. And in fact, uh, within Africa, the only major success story in terms of linking small-scale fisheries to uh, to the international market in a very tight way has been with the Nile perch fishery on, on Lake Victoria, uh, notwithstanding the, 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 these three countries, Ghana, <coughs> Cape Verde, and, and, uh, and Senegal. So <coughs> employment uh, is a very important issue. And how do we actually measure employment? Uh, well, you'd, you'd think it would be easy, uh, but actually it's, it's one of the most difficult uh, areas. Um, and of course you can break it down by looking at the number of jobs, the number of people employed in fishing, in processing, in trading, 
and aquaculture. That's, that's fairly clear. Uh, but then you have uh, different ways to measure how, whether somebody's employed. Are they employed in that job full-time? Are they part-time? Uh, do you sum together those who are working full-time and those who are working part-time? Or do you work out what proportion of the time those part-timers are working and, and add that to the full-time and call it full-time equivalent? And uh, ultimately, this is because many fishers who work, or many fishers or fish processors or fish traders, particularly in less developed countries, uh, they have alternative activities. Uh, they don't just work in the one, one job. Fisheries are seasonal, for example. So maybe when there's no fish available, uh, of course, you've still got to feed your family, so you go off and you do something else. You go, do some, go and do some farming, or you, you trade some other commodities. Uh, or you might go and work in construction. So you have to also look at what people are doing when they're not engaged in the fisheries activity. So this makes it much more difficult to, uh, to uh, assess the level of employment uh, in an accurate way. But it's very important that we also think about these other activities, that we think about processing, uh, we think about trading, because when you talk to people in different segments about their jobs and their work, it's very clear that they have different interests. Uh, so uh, I know that in many countries, fishermen are very well organized. They have strong voices. They can influence policy. But uh, maybe they're not the beginning and end of the story. We have to also think about the fish processors and uh, to what extent uh, uh, they have an opinion. Uh, just one example, uh, fishermen, has an I fishermen have an interest in uh, things like uh, maintaining prices. I'll come to this point a little bit later perhaps, but they have an interest in, in main maintaining prices at a, at a high level to improve their, their income. So they'll be against the idea of imports of raw material. Processors are interested in maintaining constant supplies of raw material to be able to keep working and supplying their customers. So there are immediately some differences of, of opinion there. I'll come to this point in, in more detail. Um, the other thing to look at as well in terms of these uh, various activities is the, is the um, social aspects, the, the way in which different groups might participate in different activities. Particularly in Africa, you find that there is a, a gender divide with uh, men going fishing, women doing processing and trading. And uh, so there are very significant gender issues which need to be taken into account in the, uh, in the way in which uh, jobs are developed and protected and sustained. So the third reason for going fishing would be in terms of uh, food security. Here's a graph which shows uh, estimated seafood consumption uh, from 2010 and we can see that there this is actually a US piece of data, so this is in pounds, not kilos. But you can see there's a, a vast difference in terms of uh, fish consumption around the world. It does vary an awful lot, both between countries and within countries. And one of the things we need to know if we're going to make sensible decisions about development policies and so on is uh, what is the level of fish consumption? What is the uh, contribution 
of fish to our food security uh, position. And it's not just a matter of uh, protein, uh, although protein is, is very important. And we can see that on this table here, uh, there's a, a difference in the way in which developed and less developed countries uh, need to, to eat fish. Um, <coughs> fish is disproportionately an important part of the diet for less developed countries. So we can see that out of, uh, here we have the developing countries, it's approximately 20% of your animal proteins, 20 to 25% are going to be derived from, from fish. Whereas in, in developed countries, uh, although they, in, here in, in the West, we eat a lot more fish than, than we do in developing countries, uh, we also consume a lot more of other protein foods. Uh, so things like uh, meat and milk and so on, the consumption is, is also much higher. So proportionately, fish is a less important part of the, the diet. Uh, and there is an argument to say that uh, the dietary contribution of fish in developed countries is, not, is perhaps not so uh, critical, should we say. And we can say it isn't critical at all when it comes to things like uh, protein supply. Uh, in the West, we're not protein deficient. We may be deficient in some other of the micro components of, of fish. And this is one of the aspects, I think, of the food security contribution of fishery products in developing countries has not really been explored at all from the point of view of micro uh, nutrients and particularly we're talking about vitamin B12 which has a, 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 which you can only obtain from animal products so in countries where they're protein deficient because their consumption of animal products is is very low fish could actually make a, a big big difference to nutrition vitamin B12 is one of these vitamins that's involved in in uh, your, the effectiveness of your mitochondria in terms of your metabolism. It's important for nervous system development and it has a whole range of, of functions. And, uh, and fish is, uh, contributes uh, uh, for developing countries an important part of this, uh, this part of the diet. Uh, <coughs> when we're looking at micronutrients, we also need to think a little bit uh, about uh, the famous uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids because these are also uh, uh, substances which are essential nutrients for uh, development of the nervous system, particularly uh, two, two of them, there's a omega-3 fatty acid and an omega-6 fatty acid, uh, which are only available from uh, uh, basically fish sources. You can get them by eating nervous tissue of mammals. If so, if you eat sheep's brains or something, you'd get a good, you'd get a good supply as well. Uh, but uh, apart from those sources, uh, you wouldn't necessarily get them elsewhere. Uh, some omega-3s are available from plants, and, and these, these two can be, or EPA can be, uh, fabricated within the body uh, to a certain extent, but uh, it's, it's level, the levels are much lower. But the point is that fish is a very, very rich source of, of these nutrients. So you can see that if we take uh, herrings and uh, mackerels, the oily fishes, tunas, uh, they have very high levels of omega-3s, which are all uh, mostly these, the, these two essentials. So comparing it to other, other products, well, of course, some uh, plant products might have higher levels, but they're not necessarily the right kind of uh, omega-3. Uh, so, many countries rely on uh, 
fishery products for these essential uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids as well. When it comes to food security interests and trade policy, this is the point I, I, I mentioned earlier, that different, different operators along the supply chain will have different interests in, uh, in terms of their uh, approach to some of these issues. So that when we look at uh, fishers, for example, their interest is in maximizing revenues uh, by increasing either volumes or getting better prices. It doesn't really matter too much to them. As long as for the same amount of inputs they get, they get more money, then the fisherman is, is going to be happy with that. Um, a proce processor, however, has different interests. Yes, they're interested in getting the, the fish from the fisherman, but in a seasonal fishery or where resources might be overexploited uh, and catches and supplies of raw material for processors mm -hmm. are going down, then we might find that uh, the processors are very interested in imports. And certainly when we look at the supply deficit, as it were, uh, as we see growing populations uh, in many developing countries with fixed or declining supplies from capture fisheries and uh, aquaculture not performing as well as it should be, what's happening is we're seeing massive increases in, in imports of fish. And this is the case in Nigeria, which is historically one of the world's greatest fish importers. Egypt also, historically one of the, the great fish importers. Both of those countries importing lots of small pelagic fish from this region, from Icelandic and Norwegian operators, uh, Dutch operators, Mauritania, uh, sardines, herring, mackerel, are being imported in quite enormous quantities, hundreds of thousands of tons entering West African markets. Uh, now this is in the interests of uh, both consumers, because they maintain their access to cheap fish, which satisfies their nutritional needs at reasonable cost, but also it satisfies the interests of, uh, of processors. It allows them to continue operating uh, uh, at, uh, at reasonable costs and eliminate seasonality and so on. And that's why it's important when it comes to how one formulates uh, a policy, uh, the dialogue which uh, one goes through to generate that policy has to be inclusive. And it has to recognize that not everybody in the fishery sector has the same interests that sometimes there are conflicting interests within the sector that need to be managed and resolved, because if they're not, you may end up with some dysfunction. And <coughs> we have a, an example which came up uh, last year, which was uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and the Nigerian government, in its wisdom, uh, last year introduced a regime of import quotas. It means to try and gradually, over a period of time, restrict imports of fishery products. <coughs> now, this is something that, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, has been decided uh, as a means to try to stimulate aquaculture production. and. You, 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 it's clear that the aquaculture producers in Nigeria have complained to the policy makers, complained to their minister about uh, cheap imports of, of fish, which undermines their, their business model. And so the, this has been the policy response. But <coughs> one of the things that perhaps needs to be more considered, what's going to happen to the fish processors in in countries like Nigeria, who are relying on those imports of raw materials to be able to uh, continue processing. What's going to happen to the consumers 
who are used to having locally smoked but imported frozen herring from Norway as part of their, their regular diet. And uh, I think it illustrates the, the dangers of maybe making policies just based on one pressure group uh, or, or another without taking uh, account of perhaps a broader and more inclusive uh, approach. So, <clears throat> as I said at the outset, we have uh, quite often, when we, look, when we look at projects and objectives that are set for projects for investment by government or by donors, they're, they're couched very much in these, these terms of sustainable capture fisheries, production targets, export targets, sustainable aquaculture, diversification. This is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with these things per se. But I think sometimes we, we forget to actually uh, also say, well, what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to increase value added. We're trying to generate jobs. And we're trying to improve the food security of, of the people. And the point is that these, in my view, just couching our objectives in these terms is not sufficient really. We have to go back to these basics because ultimately these, this is what, what matters most to people's lives. Um, and we need to look at the costs and benefits in terms of economics, in terms of employment, in terms of food security. And compare our scenarios uh, uh, in terms of our options do we do nothing? Do we invest in this way? Do we invest in that way? Where do the different benefits come and costs come in terms of these, these variables? Uh, because this is where we can actually make uh, a difference and bring some rationality into the decisions which we make about what policy approach is going to be the best. And sometimes there is no best. Sometimes there are, like in the case of Nigerian import restrictions, maybe there are middle ways or different interests that have to be played off against each other. But the point is those decisions should not be made in ignorance. They should be made knowing the impacts of the different options. And until now, we don't see a lot of rigorous data uh, analysis in the design of uh, these approaches uh, to be able to balance those different scenarios. And the, the consequence of that is that we end up with policies being made on the basis very often of what is politically acceptable to the political regime of the day, depending on their colour. So it's what is politically expedient. What is administratively convenient or possible within our, within our regime? Uh, rather than thinking about you know, what is the, the best way to move ahead here and how do we put in place the mechanisms which we need to bring about that, that change. And that brings us on to the subject of the policy instruments. So even if we decide that there is an opportunity to get better value added or improve the food security of our consumers uh, by these means. Uh, how do we actually go about that? And there's a need to use the full range of policy instruments available. Uh, and of course we have different ways of doing things. Uh, essentially uh, we have a carrot and stick approach uh, you can either force people to do something under a pain of a penalty of being punished in some way, or you can give them some incentive, some benefit for behaving in the way that you want them to do. One of the things I've seen in, uh, uh, in the way in which we approach development uh, is, is that there's an overemphasis on 
legislation and enforcement and not enough on incentives for the right kind of investment. Of course the most effective system is where you have both of these things in operation. So if, you, if you're at a point A and you want to get to point B, well, you, you make it illegal to remain at point A, but you also help people to make the investments they need to get to point B. So it then becomes much easier for people to, 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 to shift their operational situation. Uh, and that means that you have to have a coordinated approach. Because the other thing I've often noticed is that the people involved in, in this are not necessarily the same institutions or people involved in this. So your, your investment incentives might be some kind of development body or development agency within the country. Uh, your legislation and enforcement might be a fisheries administration and they, they don't necessarily coordinate their approaches to ensure that these things uh, come together to create a proper uh, environment for uh, changes in the activities undertaken by, by business operators. So, yeah, I mean you have different tools. Of course you have legislation and enforcement. Uh, I mean there's a lot of emphasis on legislation in less developed countries. Enforcement generally tends to be very weak indeed. We see lots of laws, more laws than you can imagine, sometimes written, not always, but sometimes written by consultants, by foreigners, and they're excellent international standard legislation. But in terms of enforcement capacity, it's, it's not there, so the laws are generally, uh, some, in some cases, uh, not, not applied. And we don't see many incentives for investment. The, the, the money which is given by government to fisheries sector tends to go towards unproductive subsidies, so fuel subsidies, which of course has a direct impact on increased exploitation rates, which is not what you really want to do, uh, or uh, some other kind of uh, centrally planned infrastructure developments you know, government deciding, yes, we need a fish processing factory here uh, or we need to invest in a landing site here rather than trying to create an environment in which the fishery sector itself can decide where is the best place to invest in these activities. So that means that ultimately this tool of creating investment incentives which would be a much more beneficial direction for, uh, uh, for public subsidies uh, is not widely, widely used. But investment in human capital, in training, infrastructure and facilities, uh, and capacity limits. You know, if you want to reduce the size of your, your, your fishing sector, uh, that means you have to stop people from performing their activities in the businesses which they've built up over the years, you have to pay them to withdraw their vessels, to, to move their, break their vessels or put them into some other function. Again, that needs, uh, uh, it needs some investment and it needs uh, an incentive for people to, to do so. But we don't see much uh, uh, of these kind of approaches emerging in uh, developing countries so far. If we're going to try to couch our or set our policy framework in terms of these, these variables of value-added employment, food security, where are we going to get the data from? Well, uh, frame surveys are great. We need to know what we have out there. A frame survey is where we go out and we actually establish the number and characteristics of fishery business uh, operators within a, within a territory. Um, but it's important that those 
frame surveys are inclusive because, as I've said, it's not just about fishing. A frame survey should not just be about looking at canoes and boats and fishermen. It should also be about looking at processing, looking at distributors, looking at markets. These are, sometimes they're completely ignored in frame surveys. Uh, we've had this situation with the project uh, I'm working on at the moment in, in Ghana, in that uh, four years ago a frame survey was, was done in the marine sector, spent an awful lot of money, and we came up with great data about the numbers of canoes and the numbers of fishermen, regionally disaggregated, and we still don't know how many smokers, how many processing kilns, how many people are working in those same villages where our enumerators were gathering data. And what a, what a waste of an opportunity to, to actually catch that information, valuable information which you can use for policy making. So make sure your frame surveys are inclusive of all fisheries activities, including aquaculture. <clears throat> and then the frame survey is not enough on its own. Uh, it will give you some information, uh, but to, in order to get really detailed value-added and employment data from the sector, you need to follow that up with a sample survey of a number of fishery businesses, a structured sample survey within uh, within the different communities. So you're then going into individual businesses and asking them information about costs and employment and so on. Uh, so, yeah. So frame survey. <coughs> okay, I won't, I won't go through this in too much detail, but this is just a list of some of the the uh, the kind of data one would try to collect within a frame survey, fishery sector frame survey. <coughs> We'd look at things like uh, the uh, characteristics of the community, uh, numbers and characteristics of vessels and fishing gears, numbers and characteristics of fish processing, marketing facilities. Uh, then number of fishery business operators. You see, we have to distinguish the fishery business operator, which is the owner of the business, from the people who are employee, employees of fishery businesses, because they have different interests again. So we need to know who are the owners of the canoes and who are the crews, or relative numbers of, of each. The same with processing. Not everybody who is a fish processor has their own business. Uh, some fish processors will employ other people to do, their, to do their work. And also don't forget the importance of knowing something about the uh, organization of the sector. Are there associations? Uh, are there cooperatives? These kind of bodies. Vitally important because ultimately this work is going to lead into some uh, policy initiative which will require you to talk to the sector. Well, how do you talk to the sector? The only way you can do it is through having a fishery sector organization and apex bodies. Uh, so one of the things that uh, very often we, we would like to see uh, to be able to have a dialogue with a, with a sector is, well, who represents fish processors? Who represents fish traders? Sometimes you can't point to somebody. So how can you, if, if you want to have a policy to bring in improved smoking technologies, well, how can you do it? Because there's no means of having a, a dialogue with the sector about that. So sometimes you have to go a step back and start creating these uh, sector organizations in order to be able to have uh, somebody to talk to about these issues, somebody to help you communicate with the sector and to implement your, your project. So, <coughs> after the frame survey, we're then 
uh, undertaking a quota sample survey of fishery business operators. As I say, this is a much more detailed survey. You, you use a stratified quota sample divided by, with your strata in, by regions and different types of operators, maybe different dimensions. And you, you ask all of these kind of questions about their business, which allows you to essentially create a picture of the uh, costs and revenues uh, associated with that activ activity. And on the basis of that, you can calculate your value added. And you're also asking them here about who they employ, how many people they employ. So you can also start to say something about the numbers uh, involved. And because it's a stratified quota sample, you can then raise this data to the level of the sector as determined by your frame survey and come up with an estimate for uh, what the level of activity in different regions is, uh, disaggregated by uh, dimensions of business or, or, or whatever. So this approach gives you a very useful and powerful set of data. Uh, okay, so this is just a questionnaire we're using in Ghana at the moment for implementing this, this approach. Uh, just the, to show that <coughs> questionnaire design is also a very important uh, part of this. Uh, you, my best advice would be to spend almost as much time designing your survey as you would do implementing it in the field uh, because it has to go through several iterations and you also have to think about your data analysis. Uh, it's not just a matter of running out and asking a bunch of questions and getting data in. For it to be effectively used it has to be structured in such a way that you can in fact put it into a, a database and uh, analyze it. So you have to have very clear uh, survey objectives set out. What is it you're trying to achieve? So here, you know, we've, we've tried to structure the, the, uh, the questionnaire layout and the way in which responses are recorded. So this facilitates uh, coding and entering into a database, which you can then set up uh, using a statistical package uh, we, we, we use uh, SPSS, Statistical Package for the Social Sciences, but any database package will, will do these kind of uh, jobs for you. Um, and then one of the things you can do, uh, which is a technique which is used in the EU for uh, structural funding, uh, structural funds are the, is the term the EU uses for subsidies. They don't like it when you use the term subsidies, but they are in fact subsidies to, to the sector. And for the first time in 1999, I think, the EU used a, a regional approach trying to analyze fisheries dependency in different areas of the EU in order to, to determine what level of funding should be allocated to uh, uh, various investments under the EU fisheries structural funds. Because what they, the EU approach is to say, well, if you're investing, say, 100,000 uh, in an approved activity, in, in a relevant activity, say, aquaculture, you would qualify for a grant for 50% or 60% of the, of, of the capital. And that amount was determined by the level of fisheries dependency. And this approach is very much appropriate for fisheries development because one of the things it allows you to do, as in this case, is know exactly where your regions of high dependency are. So, here we had data from the frame survey, which was on numbers of fishermen, and we just simply compared it with data from the census in terms of numbers employed, and we could come up with a uh, map of coastal regions 
where we actually knew the percentage of jobs in fishing, percentage of all jobs in that region, in that municipality or in that district which were uh, due to fishing. And so if you take places like Accra, the capital city, of course there are a thousand fishermen there, but it's a massive city of you know, several million people. So relatively, fishing dependency is, is very low. And nominally, of course it's not always the case, and you can't assume this, but nominally you could say, well, if those people weren't fishing, they could get jobs in other, in other sectors. It's not always the case because sometimes there are ethnic and social and religious and cultural barriers to moving from one from fisheries to another activity, which you have to be aware of. But nominally, one uh, from an economic point of view, uh, people could engage there. So, very useful policy tool there to to help guide this donor-funded investment. And uh, this approach, this is the first time, in my to my knowledge, that this is, approach has been used anywhere in in Africa. And we need to see more of it. We really do, because, you know, otherwise people make decisions just on politics mainly. And I'm not saying these decisions ultimately uh, are not going to be influenced by politics. They are. And uh, clearly there are going to be political overrides to what the data tells you. But at least in that situation it makes politicians think clearly and come up with rational justifications for the decisions that they make. So, <coughs> yeah, so th this illustrates the importance of, you must not omit the spatial element of the data. You have to catch where the, where the business operator is and define it in terms of uh, <coughs> their coordinates, essentially. And this is where having a little GPS system to, to catch that information is great and you can combine it with GIS mapping programs and come up with these kind of approaches. And this is absolutely essential, I think, because one size does not fit all. What works in one, uh, <coughs> what is appropriate for one district may not be appropriate for another. And by characterizing our data spatially, we can uh, start uh, making some various, uh, various, uh, sensible decisions. Uh, now, when we come to consumption, uh, which we need to know from a food security point of view, typically we do a very crude estimation, which is actually not a consumption. It's, uh, it's a utilization of fish calculation. And we work out uh, production, which is capture fisheries plus aquaculture, and add imports so we get total supplies, we deduct exports and we end up with an idea of what, what, is, uh, what is consumed. But it is only an idea because it ignores undeclared production. You know, most countries our production data is only estimates anyhow. Uh, it, it includes, uh, it does not include non-food uses, so fish may be used for uh, animal feed or for bait. Uh, spectacularly, it ignores yields uh, in that exports are often uh, uh, FOB uh, quantities and values uh, and uh, free on board of processed product, of finished product, which of course, you know, in some cases if you take a canned tuna, it's, it's widely different to the volume of raw material because of the difference in, uh, in production yields. Um, and also, we, of course, doing it on a country basis, uh, it omits variations within the population and if you're thinking about food security you need to know who is at risk from various uh, uh, food security uh, deficiencies and these are often related to uh, regions or spatial issues 
age, social class, religion, uh, preferences, seasonality, all of these things need to be understood in a more uh, a coherent way. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so uh, it means that you have to do a consumer survey of fish consumption. And the only way to do this is to get out there and start interviewing consumers. And <coughs> again, quota sampling according to region, age, sex, etc. Um, usually focused on people responsible for purchasing the food um, and asking questions such as frequency of consumption of fish at home, outside the home in, uh, and inside the home, quantities and, species and types of species uh, consumed. So you actually get uh, an idea of actual quantities uh, consumed. Okay, it's a bit small this, but this is the kind of questionnaire. But there are three basic questions you, you need to ask here. How many times per week or per period do you buy fish? How much fish do you buy each time? And uh, what, uh, what are the types? And then ask something about the family com composition, so you know how many people are eating that, that fish. And with that data, you can then start to provide some important uh, information about nutritional aspects. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is just the results. This was a survey we did in the Azores Islands where we were measuring fish consumption and it just allows you to come up with a, a breakdown by different types of fish, fresh, frozen, whole, canned fish, processed fish, etc., disaggregated by, uh, by the island. So, once we get to the point where we have a uh, good data set, once we know something about the value added, once we know something about employment, once we know something about food security, um, we can start to design interventions. You know, we want to change something. This is the whole point. It's not, what we're trying to do here is not just business as usual. We want to somehow make things better. We want to solve problems of uh, over-exploitation. We want to get better economic benefits and food security benefits and employment benefits from the natural fishery resources which we have. So that's, that's where all what I've been talking to you about, all of these uh, measures uh, can come together in helping you to design better projects. Now, since 1986, uh, when I started working in this development field, uh, either personally or through my company, we've been involved in, in hundreds of projects, hundreds of fisheries projects around the world, as I say, 60 or 70 countries. And probably the, the net value of the projects we've worked on, it must, be, it must be hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a quarter of a billion, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that's been my part of the projects, but that's been the value of the projects which I've worked on. And one of the things that, that really has struck me is none of these projects and none of the countries that we've worked in had any of this kind of data available. You know? And we're spending all of this money, all of this money, without really knowing why, where we're going, what it's all for. And I don't think it's any secret that, you know, this is why many of these projects fail to actually uh, do anything. And as I say, I've worked in some countries where we've been, I've done the same project four times. You know, never mind the issues with the institutional memory of the, of the government, because the government changes, they have revolutions, you know, one set of civil servants gets kicked out, another new lot comes in, Donor task managers change, 
you know, they don't have the record keeping um, proper evaluations of their projects and people come and make the same mistakes. And if we had an approach where these kind of uh, approaches to having better data uh, were uh, underpinned every single decision that we make from a policy and an intervention point of view, I think, I think we'd be in a much, uh, a much better position than the one we are at, at, at the moment. And this, this approach uh, feeds in because it helps you to design better projects. This is, this is a, a logical framework approach. I don't know if any of you have used this as a project management tool, but it's a, it's a tool which we use uh, very much in, in development projects to be able to set out in one table uh, where we're going with the project. And the idea is to, on, on the left-hand side here, you have your overall goal, which is a kind of societal, global level. It's uh, reduce poverty or whatever your overall development goal is. Then you have a specific uh, purpose or outcome, which is what you want the project to achieve. Uh, and then you have the results of the project, which are the specific outputs, which uh, 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 derive from the various uh, activities. Uh, okay, we'll, yeah. and then you have activities set out down here. And you have assumptions. Assumptions are the things that allow you to move from activities to results to objectives. What would stop you from doing that? Maybe political will or maybe uh, uh, maintaining uh, appropriate sources of finance for investment, all those kind of things would be assumptions, but things external to the project. And then importantly, you have your indicators and your means of verification. And this is where all of the things that I've been talking to you can also come in very strongly because if we have data on what the baseline is in terms of value added, in terms of the uh, uh, employment and so on, we can set very clear indicators to allow us to know whether or not our project is, is achieving uh, what it set out to do. So this is one of the tools which we, we can use uh, and it allows us to establish a smart objectives, as I say. So we can have measurable objectives. Uh, so when we're setting our objectives, we need to make sure they're specific. It was a very clear target. Having good data will help us to do that. They should be measurable, of course. Metrics of your project is essential. Uh, they should be achievable. Of course, they have to be uh, they have to be potentially reachable, realistic, what can be achieved with the resources you have available, and time-related. So these are our SMART objectives. But this measurable issue is, is vitally important because uh, it, having data allows us to, to do that. So just to conclude, I think when I was talking to, to me earlier uh, about the philosophy of the program that you're on, it's uh, very much down to all of you in the future when you uh, leave this program and return to your, your home countries. Uh, you have a job to do, which is somehow to try to make things better than, than uh, they are uh, at, at the beginning. And, and I think one of the key aspects to that process of change, of being a, an effective change agent, and that's all we are as consultants or officials uh, uh, working in uh, government or research or even in private sector. We're trying to change things for the better. And one of the key points I want you to take away is that uh, we have to think very clearly about the quantitative aspects uh, and identifying the strategic benefits which you're aiming for, whether they're economic, employment, food security. Um, and invest time and money at the beginning, 
in getting reliable data. Like I say, I've worked on so many projects which we've been hampered by not really knowing anything about what we're supposed to be achieving. And spending a small percentage of your total project budget and a bit of time at the beginning to get this information pays enormous dividends in terms of the quality of the investments and the decisions which you're making. And there is a very clear set of steps to go through. Start with an inclusive frame survey. Uh, make sure that you uh, cover all relevant activities uh, and supply chains. Uh, undertake some detailed sampling surveys to get the detailed data on costs and earnings and employment. Uh, invest in a consumption survey. It's also important from a food safety point of view because <coughs> food safety hazards are also linked to various uh, consumption profiles. So if you want to know uh, are heavy metals a problem in the fish products which our country is eating? Well, it's no good taking a, an FAO or a codex recommended level or what the EU uh, says or someone else because they're, they're based on consumption profiles and risk assessments which may not be appropriate to your situation. So you have to have, uh, in order to do a proper risk assessment from a food safety point of view, you need to have better data on, on consumption to be able to calculate somebody's exposure to the risks of certain food safety hazards. So you need a proper consumer consumption survey Make sure that you disaggregate your data spatially to, so that you can say something about where there are geographic variations in the variables which you are considering. And use those findings to prepare smart objectives, uh, objectives which are, are meaningful and which you can essentially measure progress against and then use this logical framework uh, approach uh, with the indicators accordingly. Um, so, uh, that's your job. So, <laughs> uh, I wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah.